The other day, I was editing a video for Chris. It was a normal gameplay video on Tannenberg, a game that I've played since the day it released. I had played the previous game in the series for Dunn extensively leading up to it dropping, and to say the least, I was very excited to get my hands on it. Both of them are incredibly realistic shooters that take place during World War I, and every match takes place in historically accurate battlefields with historically accurate weaponry. And at this point, I've put countless hours of playtime into both of them. Each one has just enough differences to feel very familiar, but also somehow unique. Like I said, I like both of these games, and that's important to mention before I get into the meat of this. Now, back to that video I was editing. I was clipping on some footage we had gotten from the stream, and I found one clip that I can't get out of my mind. I'll play it on screen for you guys now. The I'm trying a different push angle. One more. Player. Where's Brony? You're not the player I'm looking for. You're also not the player I'm looking for. Where's the player I'm looking for? The clip is shocking to me. The way that when he shoots the enemy, he screams, and not just one quick yell like the enemies do in Call of Duty or Battlefield. No, this was a long, drawn-out series of cries that lasted more than 20 seconds. And the only reason I can't tell the exact length is because Chris walked out of hearing range. It struck me when I first heard it, and I feel almost disappointed that it had taken me putting sad music behind it and watching the clip over and over again while editing to realize the details the developers had put into this sound. With varying differences in pitch and it slowly getting quieter and louder again, this unnamed digital character hadn't truly felt alive until I heard him die. There was something so hauntingly real about it. Like I was really there, standing on a fort in southeastern Poland. The brutal realism in it made me think a lot about the history it depicted. There was probably an instance just like this one during the Great War. There were dozens of minor and major offensive launched in this region, with soldiers from places just like depicted in the game. The line between it being a perfect account and it just being a simulation began to blur, as it kept coming up and replaying itself in my head throughout the day. How could something that isn't real simultaneously feel so real? And is it normal to be so emotionally attached to something in a virtual setting? I don't know the answer to either of those questions, and I don't think I'll ever find the answer to either of them. But I want to look deeper into this and really tackle why it has the effect that it does. Let's start with the aspect of realism in itself. Tenenberg and Verdun both go the extra mile to make sure what they're putting in the game is just like it happened in real life or as close as possible with the limitations of gameplay and hardware. Like I said before, all the playable factions, all of the guns, hell, even some of the locations in Tannenberg are directly based on their real counterparts. And by the information in the community posts, their next game, Isanzo, will feature terrain and architecture that is exactly like real locations. Realism's effect in games is incredibly profound. It's an interesting choice from a developmental perspective because making every gun have an accurate time to kill and adding elements that make it more similar to reality is the exact opposite of accessible. But in my opinion, what you trade off in accessibility is regained in atmosphere. The closer something is to reality, the more it feels like you're really there. And this isn't just true with game mechanics like gunplay and movement. This is also true in level design and even in story. I've gotten this same feeling about games before and in a way, I think they've desensitized me to certain subjects at a younger age than I should've. One game in particular, and probably the first instance I had ever experienced this, was with what is to this day one of my favorite games of all time. I'm talking about Call of Duty World at War. I probably played through portions of Zombies and the campaign at somewhere between 7 and 9 years old. One scene really got to me throughout this, and replaying the campaign now that I'm older still has the same effect it did all those years ago. The most memorable example was here, where Reznov gives our character the choice to kill a group of German POWs. We don't have the resources to let them live, so we can either choose the humane way of a bullet, or we can choose the hard way of burning. Now, as a kid, I distinctly remember waiting, because I didn't want to shoot them at all, and I hadn't paid full attention to the dialogue of the scene leading up to that point. So I watched as Reznov told me what I had just done, and all of my allies celebrated at their deaths. 
Now, granted, they weren't innocent people by any measure, but it still pointed out the loss of humanity. I remember thinking distinctively to myself, why did I just let that happen? I thought we were supposed to be the good guys. And that internal question left its mark on me. In reality, war is never black and white. And this game that I played with TV speakers at 720p did a better job at teaching me that lesson than the education system ever could. It took me being there and quote unquote experiencing the events to truly understand it. Violence in games is an inherently controversial topic of discussion, especially when it's as realistic as possible. Why would somebody ever want to play something that depicts true, unfiltered violence? After all, especially World War I and II depict and represent some of the worst pain and suffering in human history. So how could this be marketed as something entertaining in any way such as gaming? Isn't it disrespectful to take something so sensitive and cater it to an audience that is just looking for something fun? Well, like I said earlier, it's all about immersion, and the effect that it can have on people when they experience it in that moment, as well as, in my case, how it affects them as a person overall. To this day, I love history as a subject. Learning about the intricate details of all historical battles and the cost that was paid to get us to where we are today. Censorship and over-dramatization, to me, feel like comfortable forms of misinformation. Depictions of war shouldn't have Michael Bay-esque explosions and linear stories with black and white heroes and villains. They should be real. And this is how, to a degree, I think authenticity in games and cinema are some of the greatest unrecognized educational tools. If something is being catered to an audience for the purpose of entertainment, then it's designed to keep your attention. Visual learning is a term I've heard thrown around through my whole experience going through school. Using building blocks in math, drawing maps in social studies, and doing labs in chemistry. It would be completely insane to do this, let me preface that. But imagine in your 9th or 10th grade history class that you're learning about the First World War. And instead of reading about the events of a battle with a textbook or video, your teacher loads up a private lobby on Verdun and you get to not only learn how it happened, but see with striking detail the French assault of a fort. I think that the effect it would leave on students would be lasting, a completely memorable moment, as instead of hearing about how it happened, they would feel it. Like I said, completely insane, as no school board would ever allow students to play something as visceral and violent as a Milsim game in a class, and to be fair, I don't think they're necessarily wrong in that aspect. There's no telling how that could have unpredicted effects on those who aren't ready to experience it, and the destigmatization is also a very slippery slope that could lead to harsh repercussions as the line between violence in the real world and violence in games, as much as the gaming community would like to debunk or ignore it, is still something that's incredibly complicated, and we still don't fully understand the relationship between violent games and the brain. But even though it can't be done in an official capacity, these educational and emotional experiences are the reason I feel so drawn to all of these games. It's why I've put so many hours into Tannenberg and Verdun and Beyond the Wire and World at War and Hell Let Loose and Squad and so many other realistic shooters. The atmosphere of reality is shockingly attractive to me. And not because I like the violence, but because it shows me in great detail what and why history can't repeat itself. Tannenberg blurs the line between what is real and what is virtual, and in that, it creates a stronger emotional connection to the events that it represents. Inconceivable loss, pain, true suffering, and fear are things that are nearly impossible for me to understand from my position as someone living in the suburbs of the United States, and I'm incredibly grateful to not have experienced them firsthand, and hopefully I never will. But that doesn't mean I can't use these games as tools to educate myself and others on difficult or morally questionable subjects throughout history. All of these games are amazing in their own right because of the completely different ways they approach the same aspects while simultaneously being so different from one another. I hope me sharing my experiences helped to shed some light on the topic of historical realism and the value that their atmosphere presents to the wider audience through gaming. I think in many ways this is the most personal connection we have to those times, and even though it's all built in a digital world, at least I find something distinctly human about that. This whole video came out of me just seeing one clip, and if you guys would like to see more content on this subject in the future, be sure to let me know. Anyways, this has been Bobo Rail. I hope you all enjoyed this video as it took a lot of time for me to make and edit. These are hands down my favorite videos to make because it lets me talk about subjects I'm particularly passionate about. 
And if you like this video, make sure to subscribe to both me and Chris's channels. Oh, and one more thing, if you want to see my content early or just help support me as a creator, consider subscribing to me on Patreon. I just made it last week. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next one.